Hello, ladies, and welcome to Real Life Conversations. I'm Dr. Vanessa Ellen, and I'm so excited to be with you again on this week. I have a great, amazing guest with me. You know what I always say, it's an amazing guest. Mrs. Christine Chapel will be joining us tonight. Hi, Christine. Hey, ladies. We're so excited. Um, our topic tonight is stewarding our stories, affliction and God's design how we want another, each other as we go through trials and tribulation. But before we do that, as I always say, grab your coffee, grab your tea, but grab your Bible and join me. I'm going to start with James, just kind of to set our minds straight, also to give you all an opportunity to log on. And then I'm gonna move over to 2 Corinthians. So let's jump in at James chapter one. And again, I thank you ladies for joining us tonight. James chapter one, and it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trial, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, we know that this text is telling us that we're all going to go through trials. We're going to encounter various trials. That means different kinds, different ways. We're all experiencing different things in this life. But you know what? No temptation has overtaken us, but such that is common to man. Somebody out there is going through what you're going through but we have hope for you tonight. Jump over to 2 Corinthians with me. And 2 Corinthians chapter one, we're gonna read a little bit of that as well. Let's start with verse one, 2 Corinthians chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all, y'all see that word, all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any, okay, there's the other word. So our two words tonight are all and any. Amen. In any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Now see right here, if I was in church, I'd be like, amen. That's an amen moment, right, Christine? <laughs> yes. Verse six, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Verse eight, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Verse nine, indeed, we had the same sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, set our hope, ladies, and he will yet deliver us. You also joining and helping us through our prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Amen and amen. Again, this yes. is Real Life Conversations. I'm Dr. Vanessa Ellen, and this is Mrs. Christine Chapel. Thank God for his word, right? Yes. Oh, I was just like nodding the whole time you were reading. It's just my favorite, favorite passage of scripture right there. I am so grateful that God has given us his word to encourage us, to lead us, to guide us. We have so many different experiences, but before we get into that, 
tell my audience, all these wonderful ladies that are joining us tonight, would you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Christine Chapel. I am a writer, an author, a mom, a wife. I am the podcast host for the Institute of Biblical Counseling and Discipleship. The show is called the Hope and Help Podcast, and we mm-hmm. host biblical conversations about life's challenging problems there. And I'm really privileged and honored to have that ability to host those types of conversations to offer gospel hope and help for people who, who need it. Um, and I serve at my church as a biblical counselor. I'm actually in the process of getting ACBC certified. So I'm right smack dab in the middle of my supervision hours and am working on a couple of writing projects too. So some books, um, Lord willing, releasing next year. One is called Help. I've been diagnosed with a mental disorder. And then the Mm -hmm. other one is called Midnight Mercies, Hope for the Dark Hours of Motherhood. Wow. But you already have some publications out right? Yes. Earlier this year, the Lord gave me the opportunity to collaborate with Shepherd Press and Paul Touch is there with um, the title, Help My Teen is Depressed. And that actually kind of ties in a little bit to what we'll be talking about tonight, but I did have that release earlier this year. And then a self-published title about four years ago when I did not even have any kind of audience. I didn't even have a blog. But I, I wrote a manuscript and submitted it for a contest and won a publishing package and wow. it self-published. And so that title is called Clean Home, Messy Heart, Promises of Renewal, Hope and Change for Overwhelmed Moms. And I meant to have those to show, but we'll put them up in the link because uh, I do have, I have the little pamphlet right there and I forgot oh, to grab it. But yeah. Yes, <laughs> that is really nice. Well, I want us to jump right in, but ladies, I want to remind you, it's just a conversation. That's what I want to do on Thursdays, bring you ladies from different walks of life, different viewpoints. We all believe in Jesus Christ, but it's a way to encourage you as you go through life, but it's a conversation. So don't feel like you can't jump in and write us a question or shoot us a comment or something like that. Just jump right on into the conversation. All right, Christine, I want to start by backing up. And can you give the ladies just some of your testimony? But let me preface that a little bit. Sometimes I feel like um, we don't want to share what we've been through because we don't want the scarlet letter in the church. We don't want people looking at us sideways. We don't want, um, we might not sometimes even want to remember, but I do believe that it is helpful to give hope to others that if God can bring us out, then surely he will assist them in their trials and their tribulations, as we read in James. So would you mind sharing your testimony with them? Absolutely, yeah. So I first came to Christ as a 28-year-old atheist, really, just a few weeks after my father passed away from cancer. I like to say that I lost my earthly father and soon after gained my heavenly one. And mm. so that, um, that is a very dear time in my life where the Lord really entered into my grief and, and gave me hope where I really did not at all have any hope. Wow. It was a really painful process, but mm. um, that began my Christian walk. But really the, the ministry the Lord has given me, I think even started in my teenage years, I began um, dealing with issues like depression, panic attacks, self-injury. Um, you know, I have a scar on my hand from cigarette lighter burns that I did uh, on my skin. And I look at those scars now and I see them on my hands. And it's like right where maybe my savior was nailed. You know, it's like every time I look at those scars, I'm reminded of like Christ died for this, you know, um, it's a really, I mean, that may sound weird, but for me, it's like the way the Lord redeems our scars even to where we can look at them and see him. And so I am thankful for that now. But as a teenager, um, when I I got in a car accident, someone ran a stop sign and T-boned me and totally destroyed my senior year in high school. I was a varsity basketball player, had won some sectional championships and had even had some uh, prospects for possibly playing basketball in college. And that Mm. all got ruined and um, by that accident. And so that's really what kind of the event that triggered a lot of the pain and suffering um, that I went through. I was hospitalized in a psychiatric uh, hospital on a 72 hour suicide hold there in California. Wow. Every state's different, but in California, if you are uh, self-harming, then you are put on a suicide watch. 
Um, but fast forward throughout the years, you know, continued to, even into my Christian walk with Christ, uh, continued to struggle and ups and downs with despair and depression and postpartum issues after our third child. And um, even as a Christian, again, got to a point where the, the darkness was so heavy and so debilitating um, that the only thing that my husband and I knew to do was the desperate last resort really of go to the ER yeah. because it's the quickest way that you could get attention. I don't know. It's hard to all explain in a brief nugget, but long know. story short, my, uh, in my adult life, I have been to the, you know, call it a mental hospital, call it a behavior hospital. It's the hospital yeah. twice, twice for these issues. Um, and the Lord has been really gracious to redeem those pains for the purposes of the ministry I have today. But not only that, Vanessa, is I never imagined as a parent that I would end up taking God's comforts, how he walked me through some of the darkest times of my life, and then having to minister them to my own child, who in her seventh grade year got a, um, an autoimmune disease that came out of nowhere, hit her like a ton of bricks, totally mm. debilitated her for months uh, to the point where she couldn't finish seventh grade at school. Wow. And so it was like, I was watching my past, you know, to some degree relived and she ended up walking through a lot of the same problems I had. Wow. And I remember talking to one of my good friends feeling really discouraged and just like, how could I have not ever been prepared for this. I never even imagined my child would struggle the way I do. And she just told me, you know, Christine, there's no better mom to care mm -hmm. for this kid than you, because God equipped you through your sufferings to minister Amen. his comforts to her. Amen. So I could keep going. Did you, did you want to? That's awesome. I okay. mean, <laughs> you know, let me just step in for a moment and say, yeah. thank you for sharing because so many other ladies have gone through what you've gone through, what, what we've all gone through in different ways. Um, can we just identify for some who might wonder, am I self-harming? Am I self-injuring? Can you just kind of open that up a little bit more? Yeah. Um, so for me, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So a lady may be sitting at home saying, I... I don't consider my cutting self-harming. Is it oh, self-harming? I see. Okay. You know, like, yeah. I, like maybe just give them a couple examples of self-harm. Yeah. Well, so self-harm could, I mean, there are a lot of things that fall under that kind of umbrella, um, but anything that would intentionally inflict pain or suffering on your body would fit under that. So cutting, um, picking is common, scratching, pulling hair, um, to the point where it's almost obsessive or yeah. is obsessive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, self-harm could also extend to e even an eating disorder where you are yeah. purposely restricting your food and causing bodily harm to yourself. So I think there are a few things that can fit under that umbrella. Um, but, but anything that's just kind of a self-punishment where you're physically causing a detriment to yourself, I think would, would qualify for that. Yeah, I think it was helpful to give them some examples because sometimes I find for myself when I was going through various trials in my life, denial was a reality. So I would say, oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, I'm not doing that until somebody lays out the examples and goes, oh, well, maybe I am doing that. You mm -hmm. know, and it could, be a, it could be what you consider to be minor as biting your nails until they start to bleed. You know, mm -hmm. it could be anything. It could be, we can go the other way and say it could be, drinking and drinking and drinking until I pass out and I've got liver damage and whatever else. There are so, there's, there's a wide range, ladies. And I'm just saying this because if possibly you're listening to Christine's testimony and you're thinking, oh yeah, that's not me. It might not be you, but it might be you. So can we just cross the street now and, and show them the hope and the love that God provided for you? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think just in that time, it just really encouraging me that I didn't have to have the answers to fix my child's problems. And I think when we're in a season of, of hopelessness or pain, or we're watching someone else we love who is suffering and struggling, we want to fix that problem yeah. for them. And there are a number of reasons for that. It's not always good reasons. <laughs> Maybe we're impatient yeah. and yeah. we're bothered. And we're, we're, we're bitter that they're struggling or we're feeling like, well, they're weak and they're pulling me down. Down. I don't want to be, you know, tripped up by their, their weaknesses or their insufficiencies or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, I'm going to take a positive spin on this. I like to assume that for the most part, we genuinely want, we don't want our loved ones to suffer and it hurts yeah. us to see them yeah. um, suffer in that way. But the Lord really just comforted me in that season to say, look, all I can, all I know how to do is to comfort with the comfort that God has given me yeah. that he, I'm not alone. And so she's not alone that mm -hmm. despite the way that she's struggling, you know, and we know that there's, of course there's sin involved, right? But there's suffering, yeah. there's real pain. I mean, she was, she couldn't walk. I mean, there's real physical agony going on. Um, but that God is, is merciful and compassionate, even in that pain, not necessarily that the pain is a mercy in the moment, but that he hasn't, it's not a sign of forsakenness. Yeah. You know, it's not a sign of, well, this is evidence that God isn't merciful. Um, he's he cared for her in really um, personal ways and for our family through the ministry of the church that we were in and the kindness of the people in our small group. Um, and then even after that season had passed and praise God, you know, for the most part, she's um, has matured. I mean, there's still bad days, but the Lord got me in touch with a publisher who thought that it might be helpful to create a resource, a biblical resource that encourages parents with how they can compassionately care for a child who is struggling with despair or depression or hopelessness. Yeah. And so that was, I mean, it, that was a 15 year mini book. I, I like to think of it. That mini book like took 15 years to come to fruition because of it started way back when, when I was a teenager. And then fast forward to now my daughter. Um, and then hopefully there are families that will find hope and help through the scriptures uh, as a result of reading the mini book. So that's kind of the full circle. Not that the story's over, right? Because yeah. there's no period wow. here. It's just a comma. <laughs> right. But yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Ladies, I want to give two sides because I know that there are a lot of ladies, Christine, that think in black and white. You know, so some may be hearing you and they're hearing us talk and they may be thinking, it's okay for me to be depressed. It's okay because it's a reality that we have trials and tribulations. You just read in James, you know, so there could be some that's on that side that's saying, okay, so it's okay for me to be here. I don't think that's what we're saying. I always like to bring up understanding depression this way and not to simplify it or minimize it in any way, shape, form or fashion, but just so that you can get a quick grab on it to take every thought captive is just to say, it's kind of a point of um, not accepting what God is allowing in the moment of your life. You know, kind of trying to put perspective on, okay, we want an answer or we want a solution or we want things to stop. And when they don't, then we tend to try to take things in our own hands. Now, so again, we're not advocating that it's all right. What we, I think what we are saying is that we live on this side of heaven and things are gonna happen. And we live in a fallen world. And so as we're trying to navigate this, even as Christians, some of us lose our grip. Some of us don't really take hold of the truth. And this is where it takes others to come along to pray for us, to encourage us, and to give us the truth and to remind us of the ultimate comforter of all time. Isn't that right, Christine? Yeah, I agree. I think that that's definitely an important component to it. And I love how Ed Welch um, in his book on depression puts it in, and it's, I'm not, again, we're, this is a whole big conversation. I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but what was really helpful for me, in fact, even as I was in the mental hospital reading this book, I like to say I brought, um, I brought Ed in there with me and, yeah. uh, you know, but he has an equation in there and um, that, and again, not an oversimplification, but that sadness plus anger equals depression. And I mm. love that because I think it encapsulates, I mean, again, broad issue, right? But it, it forces us to look at two components because sadness, it's not a sin to be sad. Right. And we have grief and pain and we lose things. And sometimes those things that we lost were really good gifts from the Lord. And to, it's right to mourn them. 
Um, and sometimes sorrow comes through our own, you know, foolish choices, but there's sadness, right? So there's that suffering component, but then there's that anger component, which I think ties into kind of what you're talking about of that, well, this is happening and I'm against that. <laughs> I'm against what's happening right now in these circumstances and God, why aren't you helping me? And I, I need exactly. this fix now. So I just, I like, I like that particular view um, because it, it keeps us soft, I think, to both, to both, sensitive to both sides of it. Um, and yeah, so I think that, I think that those are helpful things to consider. Yeah, and I think that if we are going to offer hope to ladies, we can't be so quick to write them off. Ah, she's depressed. She's not accepting what God has allowed. Oh, she's uh, sorrowing in a way that's ungodly. Y you know, there's compassion yes. because uh, my issue may not be this, but it definitely is something else because I'm still on this side of heaven. So the same comfort that I have received in whatever my issues are, because I like to say we all have issues. We all have some kind of issue because we're wrapped in this flesh. Right, and, and, right. and and it seeks to go against the spirit as often as possible. So I like to remind myself and to remind ladies, listen, we need to be gracious. Now, I'm not saying don't speak the truth in love. I'm not saying that there's not sometimes that we do things and we get ourselves into predicaments and that causes sorrow or whatever else. But sometimes life just offers up a cup of sorrow that maybe you just can't quite figure out how to deal with like the loss of a loved one or something like that. Now, I'm, I'm not discounting what the word is saying. We don't grieve as those who have no hope, but possibly as I'm getting through my grieving, I get lost in that and I need, I need a way back. I need someone to guide me back to the hope of Christ. And that's what we saw in 2 Corinthians. Absolutely. I love 2 Corinthians 1. And I think too, what's really encouraging of that, about this particular passage is just how Paul continues to use the word affliction over yeah. and over and over. And I think sometimes when we think of affliction, we think of like a physical affliction, you know, I have a bodily ailment or, and it could mean that, but to be honest, when I was studying this and I look at the actual word he's using, he's not talking about a physical affliction. The, the word actually talks in, um, in the original language, it means that there's like some kind of situation causing an internal pressure a mm -hmm. feeling that you're in a situation there's no way of escape that i'm mm -hmm. hemmed in like backed into a corner by a pack of wolves and i'm about to get devoured like that's how intense paul is describing the afflictions that he's talking about and i think that just really opens up our scope of any kind of suffering even when it's caused by our own foolishness or bad choices that that sense of hopelessness despair um is the kind of affliction that Paul is talking about here. So it really pulls us in because then what is, how does he even answer the mm -hmm. affliction? He's bringing in God's comfort. And he mm -hmm. says, like you said, Vanessa, there is a comfort for any and all of life's afflictions. Yeah. Um, and so that's just really encouraging because then that leads to the question, well, what is that comfort? And I personally think, well, that's Jesus Christ. He's the only comfort big yeah. enough right? It's the gospel. Yeah. It's all of yeah. God's promises that find their yes in Christ. This is the only comfort big enough to bear the weight of all and any of life's afflictions. Mm, I love that. I love that. Now I like practical theology. So yeah. I could hear some of the ladies out there saying, okay, I get it. I get it. But give me the so what, what yeah. do I do with my sorrow? Or let's be more practical. What do I do with my drinking situation? What do I do with my cutting situation? What do I do? Because it could be that there's a lady listening to us right now plotting her suicide. She needs to know practically, what do I do? I got a couple well, of things yeah. I want to add, but go ahead. Oh, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you if you were going. No, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, look, if, if there's someone who's watching this, who does not feel um, like they can be safe with themselves, then please, please reach out to someone and, and ask for help, ask for a friend to come sit with you, ask for someone to take you to the emergency room. I mean, um, you, you don't need to suffer like that alone. I, in fact, I would be begging you not to suffer those feelings alone. Um, God designed you for community and he wants to help. And sometimes it takes an extreme act of humility to open ourselves up to get that help. Um, so if that is you listening tonight, then this is, 
this is a word for you to, to um, accept God's grace for you by humbling yourself and asking someone to help you because it doesn't have to go on like this forever. Um, and then what, what did you have to offer? Yeah, well, I'm going to pick up with your humble yourself. Under your, humble yourself, first of all, to, to, to go ahead and acknowledge your situation. That may be the biggest elephant in the room where, where no one knows, nobody can't see where you are self-harming. You know, they don't really know the story. That might be the biggest first step that you can make. I would say, yes, you need to humble yourself and let someone know. If you are in a church, go to your church, go to your leaders, go to your pastor, go to your women's ministry leader, or call them now, since we're in a COVID environment, call and, and, and let someone know what you're struggling with. And I agree with Christine. If you feel that that you just can't bring yourself to do that, to tell someone who you know, call 911. Please call 911 and let them assist you. Here's what I would rather do. I would rather you be alive that I can come to the hospital and share God's hope and God's love and God's truth with you than to have you self-harm yourself tonight. And we can't, we can't give you the hope that you need to carry on. So that's what I would say first. And I would say that if you don't truly know the Lord, it's a good time to put your faith and confidence in him because I can guarantee you the weight of this world can only be born under his love, under his grace, under his blood. So I offer you Jesus tonight to say, hey, you don't need to, you don't need to be at an altar at church. You don't need to be anywhere. Right now you can stop and accept Christ and just acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a savior and ask him to come into your life and change you, change, radically change you. Now, I wanna pick up right here and I'm gonna bring Christine back into the conversation because I wanna say, just because you get saved right now, right now listening to our voice, doesn't mean that your trials and tribulations are going to end. There is a sanctification process happening for all of us. Jump in there, Christine. Yeah, I just am really thankful that you brought that point, um, Vanessa, because I had it on my heart to say something similar, that uh, just a call to the Lord uh, to come to him. I mean, whether or not that's, that's a, this is the first time you're doing that, or it's, you know, maybe a time where you felt like you have pulled away for a long period yeah. of time, running to all kinds of other sources of comforts and refuge, yeah. and all of them have failed because they, they will, they will eventually fail you. Um, yeah. I mean, I love even when we open up at the beginning of first, uh, Second Corinthians 1, um, Paul is talking about blessed be God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercy, the God of all comforts. He's using that word father. And it's like God's comforts are for his children. Mm. They're not the comforts for everyone. These yeah, are privileges yeah. for being yeah, a child yeah. of God in Christ. And so if you yeah. come to know the Lord in this way, where he is your, you can call him, this is my blessed father. I know this father, he is the father of mercies, then you yeah. can know for sure that he has comfort for you by the yeah. blood of Jesus in any and all of your afflictions. And like Vanessa was saying, it doesn't make your life perfect like that. In fact, she even continued later on in this passage, mm -hmm. Paul was talking about how he despaired of life mm -hmm. itself because the afflictions he was going through were such a burden but I would say a practical point, if you find yourself in that same kind of burden, is to just, let's pick a small little nugget out of here and know that what Paul says about his affliction and the purpose of it is true for you tonight too. That this, this season is so that you would not trust more in yourself, huh. but that you wouldn't yeah. trust in yourself, but you would trust in the God of all comforts who hmm. raised Christ from the dead. And he intends to do the same thing for you, you know, your soul and your body, you know, in the future when you go to heaven, but there's a resurrection that can happen even now, right? Mm. As God is doing a redemptive work through our pains and our suffering. Yeah. I like when you said all these things that we put our trust and our confidence in will fail us. You know, that is something that I think is nice to remember and to remind the ladies of. Everything that we put our hope in that's outside of Jesus Christ is going to fail us. Now, now let me tell you, that could be husbands, brothers, fathers, mothers, sisters, jobs, careers. We know that through COVID. <laughs> it will disappear. All these things will fail you. And I can guarantee you as well, another cookie, another glass of wine, another sexual encounter, 
all of that is going to fail you. It will only numb the pain for so long. So I encourage you, try Jesus. And ladies, for those of you who, you know, you put your faith and confidence in Christ, but you're still struggling. You still find yourself in despair. You know, there's hope. First, I would offer confession and repentance to you because we put our hope and faith in things that aren't solid. It's like shifting sand. So we confess, God, I've trusted this, 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 and this. And I've even trusted in my own ability. Confess, repent, go to God. And then you've got to trust that he's going to work it out, but it's in his timing and it's in his way. See, that's where we can despair. When we want it to happen differently now, it's in his timing and in his way. Yeah, it um, just makes me think of uh, Psalm 119.50. Uh, this is my comfort in my affliction. Same word, right? That Paul is mm -hmm. the same meaning of the word anyway, that Paul used. Uh, this is my comfort in my affliction. So this is my comfort, the psalmist is saying, in those moments when I mm -hmm. have this internal pressure inside of me, it is so overwhelming. This is my comfort wow. in those moments when I feel like there's no way of escape. Mm -hmm. And what does he say? That your promise gives me life. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. And it ties perfectly into what we were reading in second Corinthians, because just later on in second Corinthians one, Paul says for all the promises of God find mm -hmm. their yes in Christ. That mm -hmm. is hope. It's a hope for tomorrow. It's a hope that sustains us for the day. Yeah. It's a hope that says, like you were talking about, Vanessa, I will wait in the Lord right? Mm. I will put my trust in him and wait because he is my rock and my salvation. Um, and two, I think it helps to redirect, you know, these types of internal pressures turn us inward on ourselves. Um, but when we have hope, right, it starts to lift like our eyes to the horizon, like we're lifting our eyes to the hills. Yeah. And maybe we can say, well, what is the next right thing that I can do um, mm -hmm. despite this situation? Because I'm not fixing it in a day, Right. I wasn't sitting in a mental hospital like, well, my life's going to be perfect tomorrow. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I nope. wasn't watching my daughter suffering in the hospital like, well, we're going to fix this problem and walk out of here. You know, but it's just life is a, a series of moments. Right. Um, and we walk by faith and not sight. And so just I think if we could maybe even move to like what is I hate to use sometimes purpose in the pain with because yeah. sometimes that can come across as unsensitive or insensitive. But there's a plan. Yes. Right. There's a plan for the afflictions that we go through. And Paul talks about it here. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to, to shift on to that part. Yeah. So then we can go back to James, you know, yeah. because I think sometimes we have to remember there's a verse and I can't remember it right now, but the scripture says God allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So, you know, he's that kind of God. He's working it all together for his glory and for your good. Yes, there is going to be rain. It, we saw that in James. But I think as Christine is mentioning, when we're talking about, okay, so why? Why? Why is it raining? I think it's Matthew 5 and 45. But, but why is it raining in my life? What, what is going on? Consider it all joy, my brother. And I like to go through this verse and tell ladies, this is not, oh, ha, 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 joy. That, oh, it's raining. Oh, you know, my whole house has COVID. Oh, ha, ha, ha. It, it, that's not it. It's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. It's the joy of knowing that God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. Nothing gets by him. You can rest in that. Uh, my brother, when you, when, because it's not if, when you encounter various trials. Now this is, gets back to where Christine was going. Why? What's the point? Knowing that the testing of your faith, you know, we, we're not perfect people and we're never going to be perfect. So what God is doing for us is he is strengthening and bolstering our faith so that it will produce endurance so that we can go through this life and endure the hardships of living in a fallen existence. And then it says, and let. And I, I like to, to draw down on that word let because I feel like sometimes God is pruning us and shaping us and we're going kicking and screaming, kicking and screaming. It says, let. Let endurance have its perfect result. And here we go. So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Sum all that up to make it short would be so that you grow in Christ, so that your faith is strengthened. 
so that you can go and tell others that now you know that you know that you know that God is a good God and that, yes, it might be raining, but he is still a good God. What do you think, Christine? Yeah, I think when we take the time to really think through those things, you know, and sometimes we need someone else, like you said, we need, we're designed for community. We need a mentor. We need someone who will speak truth into our life and, and help us to see, because when we're walking through affliction, it's like a, a smoke screen. Yeah. We're not seeing our perception is wonky. You know, it's pain, it's intense, it's confusing, it's disorienting. And that's why we can rejoice and have joy in the trials. Lord, thank you for tethering me to heaven. You know, yeah. I know that however rocky this road is going to be, that I am tethered to you yeah. and I'm not going to walk this right. I'm not going to sail yeah. through this without any, you know, uh, fault, but you've tethered me. And so anchoring us then I think is really important. It gives us hope. But two, I think we, we, when we, especially when we incorporate others into our journey, we start to see that God's design for the afflictions that we're going through. We have actual opportunities to then share how God has come comforting us. Mm. And I think sometimes we think that I can only share how God is comforting me once this is all done, yeah. you know, once I'm done with this. Yeah. And I think sometimes depending on what the situation is, there may be wisdom in that if it involves other people, if it's right. a very tragic thing where you're just un spiritually super unsettled. But yeah. I think for the most part, and as in terms of like our our fellowship with one another, I mm -hmm. am encouraged to see someone in the midst of their pain and suffering show me how they are crying and waiting on God. Like that is a testimony right there. That is an ugly faith, but it's beautiful at the same time because it's real. Or we're having real life conversations. Yeah. That's a real faith. Someone who is prostrate on the ground because of yeah. some awful news they got and they're crying yeah. out to God. That's not a defective thing. That is an amazing mercy. Um, yeah. It's an evidence of this person knows where to turn. Yeah. right? They know the refuge that they have. And so uh, that's the design really for one another care is that we get those comforts from God in our affliction and that we act as conduits of that comfort. Um, you know, that we comfort those who are in affliction with the same comfort yeah. that we ourselves have been mm -hmm. comforted by. Yeah. And so we don't hoard it for ourselves, like a little, you know, pouring it into a cup. This is mine. I'm not sharing it. <laughs> we're, we're like a water hose of comfort yeah. to people. And that's how the God gospel is spread to hurting people, you yeah. know, and, and that's just my passion. We're not cul-de-sacs of God's comfort. We're conduits yeah. of his comfort. Um, and so that's the design. And I think when we get so um, self-conscious or we feel like we just can't let anyone know, yeah. Um, we're missing an opportunity to let the gospel go forth, right? right. We're, we're, we're almost like we're quenching the spirit because uh, you never know how God is going to use your story to encourage someone else. I never would have known when I was an 18 year old in high school that I would number one, even be a Christian. I would have never put that on my yeah. radar, yeah. but even to have the ministry that I wow. have today, never would have guessed, but that's how God works, right? <laughs> that is how he works. And I am grateful for what he has done in your life. And ladies, as we wrap this up here in a moment, feel free to shoot us your questions and comments. Remember, it's a conversation. We want to hear you. Um, and I always say, if you don't want to use your name, you can always say you're asking for a friend, you know. <laughs> but I think one of the things that we need to get beyond, and I call it that Sunday morning uh, fakeness, where, you know, it's, hey, how are you doing? Good morning. I'm blessed and highly favored. You know, all of this stuff when you're hurting inside. And, and, and most of the time we are so rote in the, hey, how you doing? That usually by the time we say that, we don't even stop to wait to hear the answer. We're down the hall, in the foyer, around the back. We're not stopping to take the time to fully hear what someone says. So on the other side of this, I would say, ladies, listen to the women around you. Listen to the women in your circle. Listen to the young moms, the young marrieds. Listen to what they're saying and ask them deeper questions. Hey, how can we help you? You know, tell me more about your story. Uh, we do have a question and it says, can you guys speak specifically to life's afflictions of 2020? How have you both applied this to your trials in 2020? Wow. Do you want to start that or do you want me? 
No, I'd be happy to. Yeah. And I feel, and this may sound strange, but at the beginning of it, uh, when the kids basic, you know, the schools shut down and life seemed to stop <laughs> in motion yeah. for a minute, mm-hmm. of course, not in the way that we'd ever experienced before. But I would say that I felt like I had been equipped for it because a year prior, Brianna all of a sudden was home all the time. I stepped away from ministry for, I think, seven months. I wasn't doing Mm -hmm. anything. Maybe this was two years ago now. Um, You know, so I already went through, and this wasn't the first time in my life where I had gone through seasons uh, where I had to just literally drop everything. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I have learned, right? So these are things we learn at the Lord has to work with us on it. But I have learned that the, God gives and God takes away. And yes. so if he's ordaining this season mm-hmm. to go against what I had on my agenda, to go against all the time I thought I would have to do all the writing and all the things, um, then I just have to trust, well, this is not what he has for me right now. Yeah. And so I know that that was a hard learned lesson, hmm. not without past years of crying and lamenting and kicking and screaming like but I think now I've gotten to the point where it's like well that's I mean what control what does my being anxious about it contribute to anything it doesn't I have to submit myself I love your husband has a wonderful quote on a a talk that he gave at ACBC and I'm just going to paraphrase it but he said (laughs) you know there's so many times in life where we want to understand but God is asking us to stand under. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I never yeah. heard that. But now I use it all the time because that's yeah. what 2020, I think, is for a lot of people. God is not necessarily in the business of always helping us understand his yeah. ways, right? They're higher than ours. Um, he's asking us to stand under and to turn to him and to trust him. And so that's, I think, has been... I'm not saying I do it perfectly, but I think that that's been my, my experience. Yeah. Well, I can say 2020 has been extremely different. Uh, I I know that a lot of people have faced many things um, and we've all had to stand under, right? I don't know that we understand COVID-19. I don't know that we ever will. I don't know that we have a full answer to why it's still hanging out, you know, but, um, I do know God and I do know the God of all of our suffering. So that's how I've applied it to my life to say that no matter what, my God's still on the throne. I mean, he's not sleeping. He's not slumbering. He's changing some things, but that's his prerogative, right? He can do what he wants with his stuff. What, what, what can we say to the potter? We're the clay. You know what I mean? Other, right. And I love you started the verse, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. And I want to finish it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I have, as most of you ladies know, I have lupus. And uh, it just, I call it re- rude and random. It's just rude and random all the time. You can be sick all you want. I, as a matter of fact, I spent the majority of this day in the bed feeling horrible, just trying to raise up to go and do this here. But this year was um, interesting because my husband got shingles. And from his shingles, I got chicken pox. And then I was in the hospital with pneumonia. And so it went from this day with chicken pox to the next day, pneumonia to the next day, meningitis. And I was hospitalized for 14 days in the middle when they weren't letting any of your family come to the hospital with you. It was a blessing, an unknown blessing, just me and God. Okay, God, I don't understand, but I'm going to stand under. I don't understand. The nurses treat me like I got the plague. They don't know if I have COVID or not. They may come to see me. They may not come see about me, but it's me and you. So what, what I can say is that the way that I applied this to my life was that I really had to apply, James. Sometimes God lets things happen in your life that, that I feel like we sing about him. I feel like we read about him. I feel like we teach about him. But do we really know him? I feel like the trials and the tribulations force us to know the God that we've talked about. And in my experience, I had to know he was my comforter because man could not help me. And that's what happens sometimes in life. You can try to call me, you can call Christine, you can call anybody, but we may not be able to do it for you. The longing in your soul, the holes in your heart, the things you're going through, only God. So I will answer that question by saying, 
it deepened my faith. It did produce endurance in me. It strengthened me. It gave me a hope that I didn't have before of knowing that even in the middle of a pandemic, my God would show up and show out for me. Yeah, that's good. I just, I was, I pulled up first Peter. I think it's a wonderful verse um, to reflect on uh, first mm-hmm. Peter five. Um, it's almost like a benediction, but first Peter yeah. five ten. before I read it, I just, a lot of times in our affliction, I know this is true for me, you know, and the times we want to understand, right. When we're like, we're screaming in our pain, Lord, fix it, fix it, fix it. Yeah. You know, how do yeah. I fix it? How are you going to fix it? Mm-hmm. How are these people? Like someone's got to fix it. Right. And it's like, I just can't help but wonder if like the Lord is just whispering back to us in our screams, like, follow me, yeah. follow me, mm-hmm. follow me. And I feel like that has been his guiding through all of the different things that I have gone through. And even with, the, even in 2020, follow me. Like he's not, you know, he's redemption fixes things. Right. So on a redemptive storyline, he's got it. He's got that covered, but in the moment, what are we to do? What's that practical thing is to follow, to stand yeah. under. Um, but I love the scripture uh, in first uh, Peter five ten. he says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, hmm. not something we do, something he does, that he will do, restore, confirm, strengthen, hmm. and establish you. Yes. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Hallelujah. Good. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> so good. So good. So good. And and let me just add Deuteronomy 29 and 29. I learned this when I was in school forever ago and it stayed with me. And ladies go all the way back to the beginning. If you're looking for Deuteronomy, we don't, we don't stay there often. 29, 29 and 29, 29 and 29. And I love this. Because I used to be a bit of a worry ward. Mm. I needed to know everything, everything. Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? Deuteronomy 29 and 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of the Lord, of the law. The secret things belong to the Lord. He's not always going to tell us, uh, Vanessa, here's why I sent you to the hospital for 14 days and nobody could come see you. Uh, Christine, here's why you went through this with your daughter. And you know what? Sometimes the why is not what we need the answer to. It's the who of the why. If I know the who of the why, I'm okay. Because I know that as a child of God, God's got me. Now, ladies, we are not oversimplifying, I hope, I pray. We're not trying to make light of your situation. What we are trying to do is encourage you to know that tough stuff happens. Yes, a lot of tough stuff has happened in 2020 and probably will happen in 21, 22, should the Lord delay his return. But God is a faithful God. He will not change his faithfulness. You can trust, he's stable. You can put your trust and faith in him. So Christine, any last words, any words of hope? Anything you want to leave with these ladies? I think I just remember Jeremiah 17. He's talking <laughs> okay. about, um, yeah, he's just talking about how those who put their trust, their confidence yes. in the Lord, like they're well watered, yes. you know, the heat will come and they don't, I'm totally paraphrasing. Okay. But they won't just shrivel up and die, you know? So just the, the word of hope and encouragement, I think I would share is just that um, to, to put your hope and trust in God. Like there's mm-hmm. no other place you're going to put it where it's safe. It's just mm-hmm. not, it's not in yourself. You know, Charles Spurgeon says there's no hope for you in yourself, but there is hope in the one that God sent to be your redeemer, to be your savior. That's where the hopes we take yeah. them and we place them onto Jesus's back. And that, that is where they are safe. So, um, yeah, I think that would be, and then just, yeah, when you feel like you want to cry out in your affliction, fix it. Yeah. God is whispering back to, you know, follow me, follow me through. I haven't left, not going to leave you. This is not a punishment. You know, this is not a mercy means that Christ already took our punishment. So what you're going through now is not a punishment. Since it's not a punishment, how can we respond to it in faith um, in a way that will honor God 
help others and helped yeah. us to grow and mature in Christ. Amen. Well, ladies, I leave you with this again. You know, I'm back to practical theology. I leave you with nothing we said tonight may, may stop the pain, but God will comfort you through your pain. And you know what? One day it will get better. It might not get better tonight. You may cry through the midnight hour, uh, but you know what? God can take all that away as he works with you, as you work with him, as you place your confidence in him. But again, take every thought captive unto the obedience of God. I, I would ask you to start there. Be careful what you tell yourself about yourself. You know, uh, if you need a counselor, seek one. I, I really send you back to your local church immediately. Go running, go forth bow right now. <laughs> Call someone in your church and seek some guidance and some direction from the word of God. If you are not a member of a local church, I encourage you to find one in your city, find one in your town, find a Bible teaching, Bible believing church that can help you through this. If you're looking for a counselor and you're not a part of a church or your church doesn't do biblical counseling, I refer you to the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. It's ACBC. Um, their website is um, acbc.com. Biblicalcounseling.com. Biblicalcounseling yeah, biblicalcounseling.com. Yep. I, I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> biblicalcounseling.com. I, I, I encourage you to please reach out. The other thing is, as we said earlier, if you feel like you're not going to reach anyone and you're still considering, after everything we've said, some form of permanent self harm, 911 is available to you. Please make the call, seek help. And they will refer you. And hopefully, by God's grace, he'll send someone with truth to your bedside. Well, I'm Dr. Vanessa Ellen. This has been Real Life Conversations. I have been chatting with Christine Chapel, Mrs. Christine Chapel. Thank you again for sharing your life, your journey, the story of how God brought you through. I'd love it if you'd come back. I'd love for us to pick up on this. It's like a three-part series I'm hearing in my head. Um, but I'd love for you to come back in the new year. Would you, would you mind? Think on it. Oh. Don't, don't answer on camera. Just, just think okay. on it. <laughs> I'll, keep it. I'll keep it a secret. Like the Lord, the secret things of the Lord. It's whether or not right, I'll come right, back right. as a secret. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies, we, we thank you. Uh, join us again next week. Again, if you're in the Houston area and you don't even have to be in the Houston area and you don't have a church home, we're online. Our church is online at 10 AM and it's cof.cofbc.org. You can join us at 10 a.m. It's Community of Faith Bible Church. And my husband, Pastor Nicholas Ellen, he is our pastor. And next week, my guest is going to be Mrs. Jamie Love. She is going to be talking to us about how to deal with our finances from a biblical perspective. Thank you, ladies. Again, this is Real Life Conversations. Have a great night. <laughs>